Uh, Father God, we just thank you so much that you have given us this chance to uh, come out here today to, uh, to worship you and praise you, Lord. I just pray that this time be a time that, that glorifies you and your son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. If you've come to a church before, and you've come to it often, if you've ever made it to the Sunday before Thanksgiving, there's some things you can count on. One is that at some point in time, you will sing to him, we gather together, or come thy fountain of every blessing. This is pretty much a given. Unfortunately, that didn't happen today. That's not in our repertoire. We don't. Uh, Brett's a great musician, but I'm not that great of a picking up on the singing part. And the preacher will preach about why we should be thankful for all that God has done for us. I mean, let's face it. We live in the richest country in the world. And God continues to bless each and every one of us. In fact, we all came to church this morning without having to worry about getting taken to prison or shot or, or whatever. So God's good to us. And if you have some preacher, they even venture all the way over here and let's we'll talk about we even need to be thankful in our times of trial and tribulation. Times of trials and tribulations. You know, they'll talk about how we struggle. We have these struggles and all these things are going on and, and man, it's terrible. And right now, I'm, I think I'm going through some trials and tribulations. It's, it's, when I look at it from the outside, it seems like it's not that big a deal. I mean, I haven't had a job since April. I mean, we're not like scraping up the crumbs or, you know, counting pennies or going through the couch cushions to find money. We're, we're fine that way. But it's, it's aggravating to me because all my life I've worked. I've worked at something. I've had two, three jobs at a time. And, and it's a struggle. And to sit here and tell you, you know, in reality, it's not that big a deal. But there are times when you're like, hey, why in the world is this going on? And I think it's okay. I mean, I get up here and I speak to you, and I know a lot of people think, oh, he's got it all together. And he's got the reason I talk to you about what I talk about is because it's things that I struggle with also. Because I know we all go through struggles. I mean, I don't have a job, but I'm healthy for the most part. So it's, it's not that bad. You know, sometimes. God will take our struggles to strengthen us. Uh, the, th the, time, the thing I think about the most is probably the church in Cuba. The church in Cuba is thriving. And they're uh, persecuted by the government. They, uh, they come and harass them. I think uh, the report I have here says that there were more than 1,600 religious abuses, or re religious freedom abuses by the Cub Cuban government in the last year, 2016. I know, between January and July of 2016. You know, but when I go over there and you see these people, they're on fire for the Lord and it's like, it's amazing that this struggle is in their life. Uh, the, our translators, they come out and they tell us stories about how they walk 15 to 30 minutes in the heat and the rain and and whatever the weather is to get to church. And, and it's just amazing to me. But I think a lot of things about how we, we go through life is, is our perspective. How do we view things? Uh, I'm quick to say, like in fact, back in April I told a group in Vermont, said, look, you'll never know how much you need God so he's all you have. A lot of times we're like, God, I'm faithful, I'm going to follow you, you're all I need. And then we'll throw this little word in, but. But I'd like to have a job. I need a job, God. Or I need a wife, or I need a husband, or I need a million dollars, I need a new car, I need this. But God is fulfilling through everything that he provides for us. Because he provided the greatest gift of all time, and that's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. And if you've got Jesus, you, you've given that promise of forever. Forever living in God's presence. Now, I was going to talk to you in Luke, the 18th chapter. There's some people there that are having kind of a perspective problem, we'll call it. 
Um, probably you've heard it spoken on many times about uh, the rich young ruler, and that's in verses 18 through 25. And that's Luke 18, 18 through 25, and I'll read it real quick. And a ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, all these, I have, um, young ruler said, all these I have kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad for he was extremely rich. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said, How difficult is it for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. <coughs> Forgot the most important thing. I have to have some water today. <coughs> All right. So when we look at these verses, when we look at this, we're like, okay, there's ten commandments. What's the purpose of the ten commandments? Live our lives by. Okay. There, there's three basic purposes that show us how to live our lives. It uh, established rules for a society, the Hebrew people. But to me, and the part I'm trying to focus on today, is the most important part of the Ten Commandments is that it points to us why we need a Savior. Why we need someone to come and stand in our place and pay for our sins. If you look at the Ten Commandments, the first four are the relationship with us and God. And, you know, we would probably say, we're pretty good with those. We come to church, we pray, we read our Bible. So we're pretty good with those. Now, let me flip over to it. In Exodus 20, it goes like this. And God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. How good are we with that? I mean, really, how good are we? Uh, just this past week, I was complaining because I didn't have a job. I still got God. It goes back to what I'm saying. We, we make it God plus something when it should be just God. God. All right. You should not make for yourself a, a carved image or any likeness or anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. No images. Do we have any images? We do. We do. We get upset about all kinds of things. That I mean, would I do the things? Uh, let's just take the flag, for instance. People kneeling at the flag. Is that something we should be upset about? I don't know. I don't know the answer. I know that I would never do that. I know that I would never kneel. I would never sit. I would stand and cover my heart and sing. But when these people are doing it, you know, as we look at them, we should say... What in the world has happened so terrible to them and their lives that they perceive that this flag is the problem? And a lot of times with our perceptions, we get caught up in what we feel, what we think, instead of looking at what the other person's going through. And I'm terribly guilty of that. I mean, when that person's riding on my bumper going on Highway 52, I'm like, where are they going in such a hurry? They may be going to the hospital to have their baby. Who knows? Most of them are doing something. May I was talking on the phone, so after doing that. So, what images? What do we have? What have we put before God? Because Jesus summed up the Ten Commandments in these two. He said, 
Love God with all your heart, your mind, your soul. And love others. Can we truly be loving others if we're condemning them? We can. I mean, if we have a disagreement, I mean, I think it's fine for us to have disagreements. But if it's at the point we can't talk about it, that that's become another issue. That's, it's come past what it should be. We've made it more important than God. Because the most important thing that we're put here on this earth is for this, to glorify God. Glorify God. And it's tough to do sometimes. When you tag the guy out at home and the official says, you didn't tag him. It's like, how can you say that? I quite clearly tagged the guy. And you pitch a little fit and you go in the dugout and throw your glove. That's not glorifying God, I promise you. How can we glorify God? By making his kingdom larger here on earth. And how do we do that? By loving others. It's real simple. When we see someone falling short of the glory of God, instead of us saying, man, this guy is a sinner, he has no clue, we should turn around this way. Man, this guy is a sinner. He has no clue. He does not know the love of God. What can I do to help him find that? What can I do? And, you know, we get caught up in where should we go? What should we do? And everything we do, glorify God. And God will be glorified. And everything we do, we follow the, the leading of the Holy Spirit. So everything that we do will be fine. <clears throat> you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Uh, I heard a a pastor speaking on this, and he uh, kind of equated this to not only using God's name as a curse word, but also when we don't give God the credit for the things he's done. And he was applying it to the fact that we try to make salvation of works, or salvation of look how good I am, Instead of turning to Christ on the cross who died for our sins. Right? Does that make sense to you? He's saying that this is not only the cursing. It's not giving credit to Jesus. It's not giving credit to the Holy Spirit. There's lots of things I do. I, I wander through this world lost like an Easter egg. But there's lots of things I do. I don't understand why I do them or how it happens. But I just know that I am doing my best to follow the Holy Spirit which lives inside of me. And to be quite frank and honest, sometimes it makes zero sense. I got my first real job out of college at Nations Bank, working in collections. I got that job because one day I was scraping somebody's house. I was really tired of scraping paint off that side of the house. And my brother said, I'm riding to Greensboro to fill out an application at Nations Bank. You want to ride with me? I said, sure, let's do it. So I got in the car. He had collections experience. I had no experience working at a bank. Uh, my degree is in broadcast communications, film, radio. We sit down. We both fill out the application. Uh, I get a call back. He doesn't. I go to the interview, and I'm like, I'm not getting this job, so I'm going to answer the questions however I want to. The lady's like, do you have any aliases? I'm like, just the ones I gave you. I was like, not taking this interview seriously at all because I'm like, there's no way I'm getting this job. By the time I got from Greensboro back to King, there was a, uh, a message on the answer machine and it was like, uh, we want to hire you. So I got that job. And long story short, I ended up sitting next to Linda. Then we got married and then we have a kid and all this stuff's been going on. <laughs> And all because my brother came to me one day and said, hey, come, come ride with me to Greensboro. Because I didn't want to scrape paint. We've got to be faithful in the little things. So the first four, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. 
The first four are all about our relationship with God. And if you notice back in Luke, when Jesus was talking to this rich young ruler, he asked him about the Sabbath six, which is our relationship with people. And I kind of feel like the reason he did this was because we really think we're good with people too. We really do. We think, oh yeah, I, I haven't killed anybody. I haven't committed adultery. You know, I haven't lied. And when we just go right down the list of the things, we check them off. Oh, there's things I haven't done. I'm a good person. And I think, <clears throat> not that this guy was lying or thinking he was lying. I think from the way he was taught, the rabbis in the day would teach different things. And they would say, like, where it says, honor your father and mother. Now, to us, that all means something different. It all means something different. And to him, the, the minimum you had to do was make sure you provided enough money for them to be kept upright. So you didn't have to put them in the best old folks' home, but a old folks' home. So he was probably meeting the minimums there when he was talking about, oh, I've done all these things. And Jesus knew this. See, Jesus had also said, look, if you have anger in your heart, you've committed murder. If you've looked at lust upon a woman, you've committed adultery. And it, it <clears throat> excuse me, even farther on, <clears throat> even farther along in the Bible, you'll find where it says, you'll find where it says this, if you're guilty of one, if you're guilty of breaking one of the Ten Commandments, you're guilty of breaking them all. That's how serious it is that God has made this covenant. He's like, look, if you've broken one, you've broken them all. And this guy is coming up before Jesus and he's like, man, you know, in my community, people think I'm a good guy. They think I'm a great guy. In fact, I believe in myself. And Jesus is like, well, that's fine. But if you really are a good guy, and you really are obeying all ten, sell everything. Well, let's see you. He calls me out on the car. He says, sell everything you have and come follow me. Now, let's switch it around. If Jesus came to the door today and said, hey, guys, I got an idea. Well, let's go to the way over there, Africa. Let's go to Africa. I want you to sell everything you got, jump on a cargo plane, and let's go over to Africa. We would have reservations. I think we would. I know I would. Now we said go to Cuba, I'm there right away. But Africa, I don't know. But that's what gets back to the one. I have no other God before me. It goes back to two. No idols. No idols. And so this guy, he doesn't see the fact that he's a sinner. And if we look back in Luke again, in Luke 18, 9 through 11, we see a tax collector. And he's standing at a distance. And it, it, like verses 9 through 11 here. But the tax collector standing at a distance would not even raise his eyes toward heaven. Oh, let, me, let me go back. Let me go back. Luke 18. He also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves and were confident that they were righteous. This is Jesus telling the story. And while they viewed others with contempt, two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and began praying to himself. He prayed to himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like the rest of men, swindlers and unjust Adulterers, or even like this tax collector. This is how we view the world. This is how we view sinners. This is how we view all these things. Man, I'm so much better than this other person. But the tax collector, standing at a distance, would not even raise his eyes towards heaven, but was striking his chest, saying, God, be merciful and gracious to me. The sinner that I am, I tell you, this man went to his home justified. Forgiven of the guilt of sin, placed in right standing with God. 
rather than the other man, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. But he who humbles himself, forsaking self-righteous pride, will be exalted. I think one of the struggles that we have in America, as far as, as coming to know God, is we're, we've got too much stuff. We've got too much stuff. And if you don't believe me, uh, ride down the road and where they used to be tobacco business, now we have these storage buildings, these storage shed places, where they charge you $50 a month to hold your extra stuff. I mean, we had stuff in one one time, and I think right when we was getting ready to move, we had some stuff in the storage shed, and uh, we just ended up, I think, throwing most of it away, because like, we don't need it. I mean, where's it been? In fact, we have a rule, if, if you haven't, if you found something you've been looking for for three years, and you, you, know, you probably didn't need it because you hadn't used it for three years. All right. So, I am here today to tell you this. I am thankful that I'm a sinner. I'm, I'm not proud that I've sinned. I'm not proud that, that I've done wrong. And I'm not a terrible person, I don't think. But I'm thankful that when I open the Bible, I am completely, completely broken. Every time I open the Bible, I, I read it and I'm like, man, this is me. This is me falling short of the glory of God. This is me struggling with life. And, and it tears me apart and it, it breaks me down. And, but then I flip the page and I say, that's why Jesus died. Because I can't do it on my own. There's nothing I can do. I cannot keep the commandments. The Bible tells us that it's impossible. It's impossible. The, the, the main reason, I think, for the commandments is they point you to Jesus. They point you to why we need Jesus. Because we cannot be that holy person. We can't not, We cannot be that righteous person. And here's the greatest thing about being a sinner. In the Bible it says this. That Jesus came to this world. Not for the righteous. Not for the just. But for the people like us. Sinners. Um, I was trying to find some statistics for you and... The, the best I can. I was trying to find out how much money is spent on medical tests each year in America. Now, the, the best answer I could find, and there was one study that showed that there, a guy that was with the medical community said that there's, what well, he felt in his opinion was $800 billion worth of needless tests. Tests that aren't needed. $800 billion. Now, to, to kind of wrap our mind about how much $800 billion is, if I had $800 billion, I would not be looking for a job. And probably neither would you guys. Y'all would be like hanging out at my house doing something. Me and Tom would be playing golf here today. $800 billion. To tell us what's wrong with us. The great thing about the Bible is when we look at it, it tells us what's wrong with us. We're sinners. But it also provides the answer. And that's Jesus. And I hope today that, that you're uh, living with Him, that you're in a relationship with God. And I just want to close up real quick. Um, the thing that we talk about, repentance. Repentance is the only way to God. And I think sometimes when I talk about that, we get confused, and, and I'll explain what I mean by it. Repentance is when we quit seeking the way of the world, and we start seeking the way of God. I don't think that God wants us to make a list of the sins that we've committed, and, and be like, you know, in the eighth grade, I stole 25 cents from Miss May. 
I'm sorry, God. I mean, he does want us to repent, but it's more action. Since the eighth grade, I haven't stole 25 cents from this maid, so we're good there. He wants us to change. He wants us to follow him. And as we follow him, as we follow step by step by step with him, our lives change. We become somebody different. And that's what I'm talking about repentance. And it's an ongoing process. It's not like I've come and I prayed the prayer one time. And I'm good. It's an ongoing process. It's a day by day process. It's a minute by minute process. And if you catch me on the right day, you'll be like, Psh, I'm sure he's repenting. Yeah. He's, man. Don't come to the ball fit if you want. Don't, don't hear me preach and go to the ball fit. That's not we separate those two. I still, I'm still competitive and I still want to win and sometimes it creeps back up in there. But repentance is an ongoing thing. And I'll tell you, through my life, the more that I seek to follow God, the clearer things become. And there's still times when I struggle and I don't understand what God's trying to do. Like right now, I have no idea what God's trying to do. But I know He's there. So let's pray. Now, Father God, we just thank you so much that we are sinners, Lord, and that you saw fit to, uh, to send your Son to die for us. I just pray at this time, Lord, that if there's anybody here that needs, just needs to uh, confirm, commit their relationship with you, that they would uh, take this time to do it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.